Hello and welcome. My name is Sri Krishna and I'm with the Bangalore Literature Festival. On behalf of the festival and the Bangalore International Center, a very warm welcome to you all to World Lit. Uh, for those of you listening in for the first time, World Lit is the Bangalore Literature Festival's uh, digital literary platform, uh, bringing to you live stream sessions, uh, video interviews and podcasts with leading international and Indian authors. Uh, we're delighted to be partnering with the Bangalore International Center for this. Uh, we launched World Lit a few months ago and uh, we've had some very interesting conversations on the platform uh, with the likes of uh, Pico Ayer, Anthony Horowitz, uh, Peter James, and uh, most recently, uh, Tracy Chevalier. Uh, we're very excited about how the platform is evolving, and uh, we hope to feature more authors in the days to come. Today, we are absolutely delighted to bring to you uh, British novelist Deborah Mogak. Uh, she's written over 15 novels to date, including The Ex-Wives, uh, Tulip Fever, and uh, is likely to be very popular in India for uh, the best exotic Marigold Hotel. Uh, she's also adapted many of her novels as TV dramas, uh, including the BAFTA-nominated screenplay for uh, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, Deborah is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, a former chair of the Society of Authors, and is on the executive committee of PEN. Uh, in conversation with Deborah this evening is uh, Jayashree Mishra, uh, known to all of us here, uh, a regular on the literary circuit, uh, has also been at the Bangalore Richer Festival a few times, uh, an Indian author whose uh, debut novel, Ancient Promises, was published and, uh, and became a major bestseller both in India and abroad. Uh, Deborah has an MA in English Literature from the Kerala University and uh, two postgraduate diplomas from the University of London in uh, Special Education and Broadcast Journalism. Uh, Jayashree, welcome to World Lit. Uh, absolutely delighted to have both you and uh, Deborah with us. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Sri Krishna. Generous introduction. And Debbie, this is such a pleasure for me. I ought to get all my fangirling out of the way first, I think, lest I gush on and on for a full hour, the hour that we have, because it's hard to imagine that I've actually got you here in my living room. I've got to get you actually on that, park you on that uh, settee that you can see behind me, but we'll work on that. <laughs> but on behalf, I suppose, Due to the portal that's hosting us, I should be saying welcome to Bangalore, a city that you're not exactly unfamiliar with, are you? No, no. I mean, I, I visited Bangalore a long time ago and I wrote the best exotic Marigold Hotel set there because, because I, I loved it. I mean, I love India in general, but, but uh, Bangalore touched my heart. And also I thought it would be quite suitable for old people to retire to because the climate is so good. You know, it's not too wildly, wildly hot, um, and it's more like an English climate. So I thought, I thought I would choose that. And also because Bangalore has such a big Silicon Valley, and I wanted to bring in the whole world of cool centres and things in my novel, um, which was published. I mean, it's published. I've just checked. It was published in two thousand and four. So the whole cool centre culture was much newer then. So. I also read somewhere that you found the name Bangalore sort of irresistibly comic. <laughs> Is that okay to say it here? I wonder to a, a field full of Bangaloreans. <laughs> For some reason it is. I mean, when they shot the film, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, they, they switched to Jaipur. And Jaipur to me isn't funny at all. Um, of course, it's a very beautiful <laughs> city. And, and I, even I, who love Bangalore, must say that Jaipur is a tiny bit more photogenic, perhaps, with its lovely pink palaces and monkeys and everything. But um, they, that, 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 you know, Bangalore is, is the place in my heart and the place that the book is set in. I, I read it, yes, exactly. The, the, the name Best Exotic Marigold Hotel was just a name in the book when I read it. It was the original name that was used for the hotel, isn't it, in, in, in these foolish things? That's right. Well, well, when the book was reissued, when the film came out, um, uh, the hotel was originally called Dunromin, which, which is a very sort of Victorian, very old Raj sort of name for a hotel. Um, because it was set, you see, my Bangalore, of course, is an imaginary one. And I I've wondered how much of it had actually emerged from your imagination, because um, I know you lived in Pakistan. Yeah. I wasn't sure about India, though. Yes, I've never lived in India. I visited many times. I lived in Pakistan in the 70s for two years. Um, but the, India was always this tantalizing, wonderful country, but unreachable because the border was closed then. And so I could never go there. And 
I just longed to go. So for two years, I lived in Karachi, which was a whole other story. But even though obviously the two countries are very different, I felt very much at home when I finally went to India as a tourist. And, and I feel very strongly that a lot of British people, when they land in India, feel at home and vice versa, because we've got this deep history together, for better or for worse, you know, whatever we think right. of the Raj and Empire. Um, and, you know, America has Southeast Asia and, and all that. They've got a lot of link to that. But our very strong link is, is between Britain and India. And, you know, my Indian friends in, in Britain feel totally British and my English friends in India, you know, it's, 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 it's a fascinating, complicated, deep rooted relationship. And I, say, I thought you'd captured Bangalore very well because I've lived there. I've actually been a schoolgirl in Bangalore for about, uh, well, way back in the 70s. <laughs> uh, and that, I, th I think that was the Bangalore that your book captured beautifully because, I mean, I, I wondered whether you could, you could read just a tiny little paragraph that sets the scene oh, for those people who haven't read uh, these foolish things. Yeah. And I, I think I should be telling our audience that the book was called these foolish things and, and it's probably still available in, under that title in a lot of old Indian libraries uh, but if you were to go and buy the book now obviously you have to look for the best exotic marigold hotel that is uh, yes the book was I mean, renamed some, after the film came out wasn't it yes I mean some readers were really cross because they went and bought the best exotic marigold hotel and it's exactly the same except the name of the hotel has changed and they thought I was conning them by trying <laughs> to print book. by two books but I, I wasn't it was just it was just that but um, just a word about it, the, my Bangalore was altered to suit my story. And so I've excused myself at the beginning of the book saying, you know, but memory plays tricks on us all. Because I wanted to have, for instance, I needed, uh, the, the Marigold Hotel is set in my imagination in sort of old military lines. Um, the, the, those old bungalows which are often converted into you know water departments and guest houses because That's I still I remember yeah yes yes Some because of course it was a cantonment a cantonment town in the time of the of the Raj. Exactly. and um but Silicon Valley wasn't dreamt of when I visited way back um and and, and the old city I've sort of shifted that a bit because I I had to move things around in my head so that if somebody was walking along the street, they would arrive at a certain place. And I made up road names and shops and hotels. So the best exotic Marigold Hotel is on Brigade Road, which is not, which wouldn't be such an yes, unusual thing. I've yes, some yes more exactly. Things. No, it, 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 it is. Um, so what I, what I say in the book, I've, I've only just found this one minute ago, so you must excuse me. Um, uh, the, the hotel is, is um, advertised as a little corner of Britain, an oasis of oldie worldy charm in the midst of the hustle and bustle of modern Bangalore. Um, and I've, I've written, the Marigold was indeed an oasis. Around it, a new city had, had grown up. Property prices had rocketed. One by one, the neighboring bungalows had been demolished and replaced with office blocks. Over the past 20 years, with the arrival of the high-tech revolution, business had bloomed, boomed. The garden city was transformed into the corporate city and the Marigold lost its customers to the big new hotels springing up along Brigade Road. The Oberoi, the Taj Balmoral, the Ramashri Comfort Inn. Um, and they offer obviously, you know, com conference centers and stuff. And the, the, the Marigold Hotel is a subsiding old bungalow, you know, covered in bougainvillea and things and rather romantic but also not terribly operational and th the interesting thing is that when I went to watch the filming I mean I'm sure we'll get on to this but I then I did stay in the real best exotic marigold hotel which was extraordinary. The real meaning the one in the film? Yeah yeah. Did you? So, yeah. so tell, tell me about that, the whole process. I mean, I know that Steven Spielberg has got you on speed dial or something. He, he just sort of rings you up and, and your books, before you know it, your books have become great big Hollywood blockbusters. But if how did only, it happen? And what, if only. What well, like? the, the whole thing started because a long time ago, I mean, like way before 2004, I was thinking, what's going to happen to us all when we get older? Because we can't, nobody can afford to look after us because we live too damn long. You know, we're being hauled back from death by the miracles of modern medicine. And um, I thought, look, we outsource everything else. Why not outsource the elderly? 
And why not outsource them to India? Because we have language in common. The respect for old people in India is, is just wonderful because, you know, often people keep them in their families. We are horrible to our old people in Britain. We shove them into care homes in the middle of a ploughed field and forget all about them. And I, I, I mean, I may be a bit romanticizing that, but, but um, I, and I thought, you know, India's warm, very good for your arthritis. There's always something going on in the street. And so if you're a bit incapacitated, you can sit in a chai shop and watch the world go by all day, constantly changing, constantly interesting. Um, school children call you auntie and they're very nice to you. <laughs> you know, in England, we've got horrible hoodies who sort of, you know, gob at you and things. Um, that you for us, yeah. I know, not all of them, some. Um, <laughs> it's, it's cheap, it's warm. We're united by this um, language and by this residual sort of Raj that still sort of exists slightly. Um, our, certainly our link is very strong, as I said. We're so globalized now that, you know, if you want your grandchildren to visit, they'd, they'd far rather fly to India and have a nice holiday in Goa thrown in for mm -hmm. practically the price it, it, it takes to go on a train trip to an old people's home in England, you know, because air flights are sort of cat scandalously cheap. So I thought, I thought all this would add up to a no-brainer. I thought, actually, you know, why well, not retire to well, India? <laughs> quite the entrepreneur you are. I mean, I actually couldn't help thinking when I first read the book before the movie <laughs> happened, I remember thinking she, she might have made more money just getting, getting this idea through whichever channels you need to go through to, get, uh, to start a care home in India. But um, that, that was a yeah. terrific business idea, really. Well, funnily enough, I think that novelists and entrepreneurs have something in common. We're not so good at making money, but we've got a lateral mind and we jump sideways mm -hmm. and get two unlikely ideas sort of igniting together. So that is a money making idea. And, and you know, it, 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 it has sort of started a trend because you'll find that, you know, in Thailand and 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 I've seen it in India, you know, there are care homes opening up because it's a sight better way of getting old as long as you're not missing your grandchildren too much and maybe you've got an old husband or wife with you um, because India is so welcoming and it's so lovely. Um, you know, it sort of took, took on a bit of a poignancy, didn't it, with what's happened recently with the pandemic and what was happening in care homes uh, across the UK. But I think you did, you, yeah, you, it, that, that was just such a brilliant notion, the fact that, you know, you could send <laughs> old people. I know when the movie happened, it kind of changed slightly, didn't it? It became more a story of uh, older romance and, you know, being able to continue to dream and aspire for something beyond. It, it, you know, just, it, it changed, yes. Yeah. It, it, became, it became a sort of, you know, geriatric romance and, and mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse, I mean, I, I actually, you know, had slightly mixed feelings because somebody else wrote it in the end. Um, and, but then when I saw the caliber of the actors and, and it was, and it, and it had the big heart and it had some good jokes and it had wonderful scenes of India. And so I, and also it gave huge pleasure to people. I think one of the reasons was that it talked about cultural East West Indian British attitudes without laboring them or without being too political or um, serious and it talked about getting old without endlessly talking about incipient death because you know I'm 72 you know I'm jolly old and you don't think of yourself as old you're the same person you always were, always were and yeah. With, with, with grey hair. Well, actually, I've dyed mine, but I've got a bit of grey because of, cause of oh, this I pandemic. Yeah. Then, well, this pandemic, you see, we I can't wear my glasses to look at that grey. No, you can't see it. I've got grey roots. <laughs> You're fine. Um, I've got COVID roots. But, um, but I think that it's, it, 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 it made people realise it was quite groundbreaking breaking in its quite modest way, the film. So this is why I liked it. And of course, it's in the book as well. The book, as you say, is more complex. And darker in a way but it's it's just it's saying that we live hopefully such a long time nowadays that after retirement age if we've got the spirit and the the imagination um we can have a whole new episode in our lives 
and also that we aren't we aren't different we're just the same we're not old people we are the same person we're Jay Shree, we're deborah we're whatever we just you know when you get older you'll realize this and the film reflected that and most films about old people are about dying really it's dementia you, and yeah. death you know you're right. They're much, uh, they're much less cheerful films, and this one was 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 everything that I think your novels are as well, which is humane and funny and touching and all of that all at once. So I can see it, that it was difficult. Certainly, it was difficult for me to dislike the movie, despite the fact that I could see I loved the book so much, and I could see that there were slight differences between the two. But I thought they did a marvelous job. What about the subsequent? Because there was a spin-off film, and then here in the UK we've had the spin-off TV series, which I think will make its way to India. I'm not sure it's already not available on one of the, the other platforms, you know, Netflix and so on. Yes. The, real, the real Marigold Hotel. Yes, which, well, the, the, the spin-off film, the second best exotic Marigold Hotel, I had nothing to do with at all. Nothing. Oh. Um, so, you know, they just did it. And that That's was... That's disappointing because I have this imagined, I have this, this sort of vision of you and Steven Spielberg just sort of, you know, linking <laughs> hands and wandering off into an Indian sunset. And I thought he does everything. No, <laughs> oh, no. Actually, and Steven Spielberg was involved in my film Tulip Fever, not in this one. This, 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 one was, was, Fox. this was 20th Century Fox, um, another studio. But um, it was... The, the TV spin-off, the documentary, um, which might, as you say, come to India, I wasn't even asked about that. And I oh, was really? miffed, I must say, because they didn't, they just did it. And I did email them saying, how about, you know, a little, take me out to lunch or send me a bunch of flowers or something, you know. And they just sent an email saying, you have no legal rights over this matter. So I was, I was a bit miffed, I must say. Oh, I think, I think, I do remember uh, something I read in the papers, I think something that you said about Miriam Margolis, it wouldn't have had Miriam Margolis farting her way around Australia yes. if it <laughs> hadn't been for your book. I know, in India, absolutely, she's, she's a great farter, doesn't she? <laughs> that's, that, that's a real shame though, because I think there's so much to be had, there's such a resource that was, you know, to be mined from, from just studying uh, your books and but in the first one, you did actually go across to Jaipur and you said you stayed in the hotel. Do you have any sort of juicy stories from that? Well, the interesting thing was, it wasn't shot. It was the, some of the street scenes were shot in Jaipur and one or two interiors were shot in the, a lovely hotel with lovely painted frescoes that the Jaipur Literary Festival is held in a lot. I've now forgotten the oh, name. Piggy Palace, probably. Yes, yeah, that's it. Yes, I think oh. I do uh, remember that. But the main, the main best exotic marigold hotel is right in the middle of the countryside. It's an equestrian hotel of, I mean, it, it's quite shabby. It's, it's enchantingly shabby, um, still is. And <laughs> I went to visit it and I had the most extraordinary time because I think they wanted somewhere far away so that they weren't disturbed by the noises and, you know, all that stuff. And they could just hole up with the cast and the crew. So it was a huge Indian crew, huge British crew, and of course many extras and things. Um, so they found this place and it's called the, the, um, the Kempur something, something, Raja Kempur Hotel, I think it's called. And it's, out, it's outside Udaipur, um, about an hour and a half drive. Okay. And so I went with my husband, who I'd only married quite recently. That that shows you can have another life, you know, in later <laughs> life. Um, and we drove for about an hour and a half from Udaipur, and there was just the most wonderful sight because it the countryside around there is not spectacular. It's quite sort of dusty and grey, a few trees, a few goats, you know, the camel. odd camel. Um, and suddenly in the distance, there was this shimmering white mirage. And I thought I was seeing things. And as we drove nearer, I saw that actually it was the unit wagons, the catering tents. It was this whole film shoot surrounded by these extras who were just sitting around. And there were Rajasthani, lovely, gorgeous men in turbans, you know, swatting mosquito bites with their camels, waiting for their shot. There were young bloods up from Mumbai because the hotel had to reflect an, an, a big city of course because it was pretending to be in Jaipur they yeah. built a bazaar around it 
And um, so there were these gorgeous young chic, lovely Indian boys all in advertising and movie making and things with their dark glasses and their motorbikes and their iPhones and everything. So there were extras of, of every sort of person to reflect the, a, a bazaar. And when we got nearer, we saw that they had indeed built this bazaar around the hotel because the hotel was next to a tiny village. Otherwise there was nothing. And they'd, they'd, they'd laid a road, they'd covered the road in dust. They'd put kites caught in the trees and old carrier bags blowing around stalls selling things. And it was so lifelike that I went up to a stall to buy something and realized of course that he was an extra, you know, you couldn't buy anything. It was a film set. <laughs> and, and there was the, You're the giving best. all their secrets away now. <laughs> but, but the best moment was we arrived and the cast, um, Dev Patel and, the, and Judy Dench and Maggie Smith and everything, they're all resting between takes um, in a row. One hell of a cast that was, isn't it? it One was hell of a cast. I think they all wanted to go to India. Well, who wouldn't in November, <laughs> you know, and stay in a hotel together? They all adore each other. They've all acted and stuff. Anyway. And, and punker wallers were holding, you know, brollies behind them and things, bottles of water. And Judy Dench, I think it was, she jumped up and she said something which actors always forget to say, but she's so wonderfully gracious. And she said, how lovely to see you and gave me a hug. And she said, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your lovely book. Because Isn't actors that and directors, they all forget. They forget because making a film is such a vast undertaking, so complicated and everything can go wrong and there are millions of people around. They forget that actually, you know, I had sat at home on my laptop, tapping away, making up their characters. Exactly. And it was lovely that. It was really nice. And then about um, two or three years ago, I went back on a best exotic tour. I, I, I was a sort of tour guide from England because quite a lot of those tours started up. Uh -huh. And I went to stay in the hotel and it's completely unchanged. It had a sign outside saying Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, but it was wonderfully dusty and everything. And the reception desk was like in the film, it was just a table covered in dust with an old Dell, an old Dell computer that didn't, it was ever used, empty um, uh, cubby holes behind it with a sort of one you know, Toblerone in one of them or something, you know, very, no question of room service or anything. And, and the, this wasn't a set, this was the real thing. This is the real thing. and <laughs> and. And, and, you know, the taps coughing out a bit of brown water, if you were lucky, and the hot tap doing cold and the cold tap doing hot. And, um, and I said to the manager, who, who, I was, who I was very fond of, got very fond of, and who liked me because I'd bought so much custom to the hotel, <laughs> I said to him, why haven't you tarted it up? And he said, because it's more romantic this way. And my theory is that he, <laughs> he really adored his horses because it's an equestrian hotel. And the stables were spotless. Beautiful. We could all stayed in the stables. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful Rajasthani horses with they, they have ears like 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 the narrow heads and and ears sort of going in like a sickle. I don't um, know horses as well as that. Okay, now I'll take your horse. Nor did I, but I'm quite horsey. So and, and there was a beautiful stallion and everything. And um so the horses were in these wonderful quarters, and the hotel was just this darling, dusty, romantic. <laughs> hotel unchanged and I was very pleased that it was actually um, but uh, I mean obviously people go and stay there and the village I think is thriving because people go and they take tea and they have their hair cut and things there. You know. I'm glad you benefited from the the film even though you didn't actually uh, get involved in the scripting which seems like such a waste to me on, on their part really but I do want to also talk about your script writing work because I from, that was the other work project of yours that I absolutely adored was Pride and Prejudice. And again, I think that different, I mean, there have been so many dramatizations of this story since the 18th century. Um, I, it, it's only a matter of time. I'm not sure which of the versions have been to India, but a lot of people in India would have read Pride and Prejudice, obviously, would be very familiar with the characters. Um, but I'm, so I'm hoping that this will be familiar as well to the audience that we will be getting today. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know how how you had the gumption really to take on 
the iconic uh, Austin and this this thing that's been done. I mean, you've had Laurence Olivier and we've had uh, heaven knows uh, Colin Firth, just so many great actors playing Mr. Darcy. So what was all of that like for you getting involved yeah. in such a big project? Well, it's, it, it's a big challenge because people feel very, a very strong sense of ownership of the book because they love it, because it's the perfect rom-com. It's the, it's the original rom-com. Mm -hmm. And it gives hope to women all over the world that you don't have to be as beautiful as your older sister. Um, as long as you've got intelligence and wit and an original mind, you can snaffle the most eligible man in Britain. So, I mean, I think that's partly, you know, and that's, that's the ongoing, the, the ever, ever greenness of it, isn't it? It's, yes, it's, yes, and it's so applies. funny. And, but um, so I was, I, I, I was quite nervous because I'd also adapted the Diary of Anne Frank for the BBC. And yes. both the Diary of Anne Frank and Pride and Prejudice are the two most beloved books so well in, in Britain, certainly, and worldwide, anyway. Um, so I felt slightly intimidated, but I thought, well, look, it hasn't been done as a film, it's been done as television. Um, since your ver the one you were saying, Laurence Olivier and all that lot, Greer Garson, and, um, and that there was, was an Indian then. version called Bride and Prejudice, oh, which yes. I think was similar to Chaddha's. And again, it, it lends itself very well to the Indian setting as well, the, you know, the parents yeah. could to get their four daughters married off, married well, and so on. Exactly. There are many parallels, many parallels. Yeah. And I think that film hooked into those brilliantly. Um, so what I thought was that with a classic like that, each new generation needs a new version of it um, because the world changes so much and young women aren't like they were 20 years ago even. Um, so I thought that I will make it, I'll make the humor spring out of real desperation that Lizzie Bennet, I'm presuming people know the story, I, I can't explain the story. It sounds yeah. a bit banal when I explain it anyway, um, <laughs> which, it, which it isn't obviously. Um, but that if Elizabeth Bennet, what we don't understand nowadays is certainly in Britain with a welfare state that, that can scoop you up, that if one of those girls didn't marry well, that family would be out, they, they'd lose their house. Yeah. And there was no safety net, there was a, a dark, cold, muddy world outside where people would starve. And so it really mattered that somebody had to get married well. And so Mrs. Bennet, pushing Elizabeth Bennet into the arms of that terrible, ghastly, oleogenous curate in, in the book, yeah. um, Mr. Collins, she was actually doing a rather valiant job. To, she was trying to get the family saved, even though it might meant sacrificing a daughter. So I wanted the the comedy to come out of that. And I wanted it to concentrate entirely on Elizabeth Bennet. And because it's a movie and you have a big screen, you can read a lot of the inner life of Elizabeth Bennet on her face. Um, she was very good, I thought. She was, I thought did a brilliant job. She was brilliant. Some people didn't like her. She brought mixed oh. feelings, but I thought she was wonderful and very honest and open. And I think that because a novel and, you know, because we're, the, we're in Bangalore talking about books as well as um, the screen, what a novel can tell you, as we all know, and why we love them, is that they can tell us the inner life of the character. You know, and we can go into their childhood and their hopes and their dreams and, you know, all sorts of stuff. In a film, all we can do is to see what happens. And that inner life is written on the actors' faces. That's how they earn their money, if they're good film actors. And so their reactions to the world it, are the equivalent, is the equivalent of the inner world of the novel. And so I wanted us to have a really honest and open Elizabeth Bennet, whose face would register that. And I think Keira Knightley did it really well. I um, think everything about that movie, actually, I, it was, it's certainly, and I, I'm not saying this, hand on heart because I've got you sitting here in front of me, but uh, it, it, it worked, it, was a, it had a sort of modern sensibility to it. It had something very real about it. Was the previous one, the one with the uh, Jennifer Earle, isn't that it? Uh, really? Colin uh, yes, Firth, everyone really remembers that. Colin Firth and his wet shirt really. So yeah, that yeah. version was much more sort of arch and had a, a you know, this was all about push up bras and it was more about costume and all of that. 
What is this? You actually had the girls returning from a walk with sort of muddied hems of their dresses and the, the house they lived in was just so much more real a house. And, you know, there was, I don't know how much of that would have been, you know, down to your scripting or whether those are things that are, those are touches brought in by the director, but it was just <laughs> felt like a metrosexual, real sort of uh, depiction of Darcy. And, and all the characters I thought were so much more uh, relatable. Well, that's interesting, Daisha, you say that, because I called it the Muddy Hem version. Um, <laughs> uh, because I honestly didn't know that. <laughs> you know, because, um, because I wanted it to be real. I wanted the girls to be really young and no makeup, red noses, same dresses every day, because that yes. family was on its uppers. And although they live in quite a grand house, as you pointed out, the house itself is a, is a pit. It's really messy. Mm. Um, and the, the camera, Joe Wright, Joe Wright, who directed it, he'd never read Jane Austen and he'd never read Pride and Bridges. So he came to it completely fresh. And I think that freshness helped as well. And There's so something to be said. Yeah, and, and, and the girls, the, the Bennett daughters, lived in that house. Um, they didn't spend the night there, but they each had a bedroom and they got very intimate with the house. So it was their home. And they knew how to sort of lounge around in it. And they didn't <laughs> just drinking tea with a little finger you know because exactly. in often, often they they're, they're sewing they're sewing away or they're drinking tea and, <laughs> and it's also sort of starchy and it's not starchy life you know they sat around and lounged around had tummock aches and opened their dresses a bit because they're a bit tight and all sorts of things and um and it it it, it had that sort of messiness and i think that because of that when in the film we moved into sort of high regency world of Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley, we could see that this Bennett family were a bit sort of hugger mugger and a bit, you know, a bit rough and ready um, because it wasn't a sort of regency house with, with regency furniture. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. why do people, if they live in, you know, early regency times, have regency furniture? We don't, we don't have. 2021 furniture we've got all, <laughs> all sorts of old stuff we've got from all over the place so I, I think that Joe Wright the director ran with that it was a note in the script but he really ran with it and the, in the opening sequence if people have seen it you've got Elizabeth Bennett walking home to her house and she walks through all the washing that's hanging up and you can see what a labor it's been to do all that washing by hand very heavy sheets and you know, all that stuff. It was, yeah. it, was, it was a lovely film to watch, I must say. I know, and if anyone has the choice of, you know, which, which Pride and Prejudice film to watch, this is the one. Just look out for Joe Wright, director, <laughs> Deborah exactly. Mota, a script, a script writer. Absolutely. But, but before I forget, there was one other story about, about, about um, Best Exotic, which I must tell you, um, which is that the, um, the uh, premiere was held in the Curzon Cinema in London in Mayfair. And they had dressed, dressed the street, they closed off the street and dressed it with marigold garlands and things. So it looked absolutely wonderful. Funny. It was midwinter, midwinter when this one. Celia Imry, um, who plays um, what's her face in it, um, she, she was in a play at the Old Vic. And she's a real sport, Celia Imry. Mild, okay. mad she plays. Um, and so when the curtain came down, right across London, the old Vicks, you know, like four miles away or something. Anyway, when the curtain came down, she jumped on the back of a motorbike. She changed into a sari, jumped on the back of a motorbike, was biked up to the premiere where she arrived and things. So we were all going up the red carpet. And as I was going up the red carpet, I could, there were all these photographers and I could hear them calling out, Deb, Deb. And I thought, they're calling out for me. And so I, I'm just like, so I turned and smiled at them. And I realized they were saying, Dev, Dev, because it was Dev Patel behind me. <laughs> they were all calling out Dev. And I, I, I felt so embarrassed that I thought it was for me. <laughs> well, they didn't know that, that you thought it was you they were calling. So. <laughs> then, then I thought, none of them would be there if it wasn't for me, you know, I'm, but I'm only the writer. And with films, as I was saying, the, the writer's the last person anyone thinks about. You sort of have to get used to slipping into the shadows and letting everyone else take credit, isn't it? I mean, that, that I was in, partially in preparation for our meeting today. I, I was look, reading some of the reviews to remind myself of the, the film. 
and I did think, you know, it's, it's, it sort of seems like such a shame that the writer kind of gets shunted out. You sort of expect it to, to retire gracefully once you've written your book. Never mind the various spin-offs that certainly a, a book like These Foolish Things or Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, as it's called now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I do want to talk also about my absolute favorite book of yours, Deborah, and that is, I, I'm sure you don't need to, to, I don't need to tell you, it's Tulip. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I, I thought I might have told you this once before because I have a little Deborah Moga anecdote. And if, 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 you, if you'll give me a minute to just... Yeah, go on, go on. I don't know whether I've told you. I have a feeling I have mentioned this to you before, but I tell everybody else that I meet about it. But I, your book, was Tulip Fever, was one that sort of inspired me to try my hand at historical fiction. I'd never tried writing historical fiction before, and I did. I think it was sometime 2004 or thereabouts I wrote... And some of the audience here will know a book called Rani, which is about a real life Indian queen who uh, fought the British in the 1857 uprising and lost her life in back, on the battlefield. And because it's a story that everyone in India knows, I, uh, I, just, I, I knew I had to do something with the ending mm -hmm. um, because it, I thought it's a boring ending. Everyone knows she dies, she dies in battle. And so how does one make it a little less obvious? And that, I think what I did was I reread Tulip Fever around that time to kind of remind myself of how you go around doing this, what was for me quite a difficult genre to deal with. And the ending, it's just like a little epiphany for me. I suddenly thought, I know what I'm going to do because there was always sort of ballads that suggested that the queen never actually died, that she, uh, that, that she, she lived in secrecy, that her supporters kind of whisked her away from the forest and you know, gave her, and she basically lived the life of a poor woman after that but she was still alive. And so when I read Tulip Fever, I don't want to give your ending away in case anyone here is thinking I've got to read this book because it is a truly wonderful book set in 17th century Amsterdam uh, about real tulip mania. Mm. So um, what I did was I sort of used, I had a veiled woman in the end and wandering through a bazaar and I leave it to the reader to decide uh, who that might have been. And then I sent it off and within days it got commissioned. And I, I panicked slightly when it was commissioned because I thought I can't have that ending go. It's so much like Deborah Moka's ending in, the tulip, in, in Tulip Fever. So I, I was sort of thinking of telling the editors to just remove the last chapter. It was like an epilogue to remove it. When the editor in a phone con uh, conversation with me said, and you know what, we absolutely loved the ending. It's just such a powerful way to suggest that maybe, just maybe the queen didn't die. And I thought, I've got, I can't, I couldn't possibly tell them this. And I emailed you, which is why I thought I might have told you the story. I, you, you probably get loads of people emailing you, Debbie. That's so this, that's that's cool. Cool. Yeah. But I emailed you and said, I'm so sorry, but I, I, I loved your book so much. And I think I might have inadvertently pinched your ending. And you wrote back to me, it was quite a short mail, and you wrote back saying, pinch my ending? Ah, I pinched my ending from the French Lieutenant's yes. woman. Yes. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I double pinched in that case. <laughs> That's so true. How interesting. God. I did want the, the, this audience to hear your story about Tulip Fever, though, and your little wager with Tracy Chevalier, who was recently on this very same portal, actually. Yes. Yes. That, that's so right. About that. Um, it was a very extraordinary sort of confluence of, between her and me because. I got the idea for it um, by buying a painting, a painting, a 17th century Dutch painting. And if people go on my website and look up Tulip Fever, there's a, there's a reproduction of the painting um, of a woman. It's a sort of sub Vermeer painting of a woman getting ready to go out. And she's got a, a, her maid servants bring her a little pearl necklace and the, a man is giving her a glass of wine. And she's looking out of the canvas at us in a rather, a rather mysterious way, which I thought looked as if she was up to no good. I bought it. it, it, it I bought it from an auction and hung it in my sitting room and just got more and more fascinated by her because I thought she's, she's gone somewhere she shouldn't, she's going somewhere she shouldn't be going. And at the same time, I read about this tulip mania which was this extraordinary phenomenon for two years between 1636 and 1638, I think, the whole of the Netherlands, the whole of the Dutch Republic was caught up in this mad craze for gambling on tulip bulbs and huge fortunes were made and lost. 
and it became like the South Sea bubble. It was quite extraordinary. And they were gambling on what colour the, the blooms would be when they came out, the flowers. And if they were what's called broken, which is stripy, they'd be worth, I mean, one of them was worth the price of a house, that bulb. I mean, and this actually that? happened. Yeah. It's and there's a lot of money floating around in, in yes. uh, all of very rich. Yeah. Amsterdam was very rich then because they had this huge empire um, and were very successful as a country. So I thought what a wonderful image for um, a symbol for um, human love of beauty, but also sort of greed and stupidity as well. And, yeah. and so I made up this love story, because it's really a love story between a, um, a, a young woman who's married to a pedantic old merchant. She's really, a, a, she's married him for his, to keep her family safe, really. And she's a sacrificial really man, really. Yeah. She's a bit trapped. And, and a young painter who comes to paint their portrait. And it's, it's, it's a big love affair. And the couple cook up a plan to elope together and they, they gamble on tulip, tulip bulbs to get the money to go to abroad, Java or something. And it goes disastrously wrong, of course, because it's a novel, so it's bound to go disastrously wrong. <laughs> and, and when it's I was finished, it was yeah. extraordinary because when I finished it um, and it was published um, before it was even published, as, as you were saying, mentioning Steven Spielberg, my, it was optioned by a producer and the producer got a call within a week of me giving in manuscript in saying, this is Steven Spielberg. I'm calling from my car. You know, I've never been so excited by a book and things. She thought somebody was joking, um, but it was him. Good. And within a week, she and I had flown to Hollywood to have a meeting with him. And it was going to be the big British film of the year. It was going to be a $48 million movie and all sorts of things. But anyway, that, that's another story because it all came went disastrously wrong. But very soon after the book came out, I was sent a proof copy of Girl with a Pearl Earring. And Tracy Chevalier, who, as we were saying, was um, on only recently on your um, uh, video. and. Um, she got in touch with me. She lives nearby in London. She said, you know, oh God, everyone's going to think I've copied you. <laughs> I've done a, pastry, done a copy. Um, <laughs> and, um, and she, and she, and I said, look, don't worry. I was rather patronizing. I said, don't worry, Tracy. You know, when your book comes out, I'll give it a lovely review and we'll do literary events together. And, you know, I'll talk about your book and you can talk about mine. And, you know, you could, I sort of be on my coattails. And so what happened was I, I gave it a, a good review because it hadn't had many reviews. Also, it had a terrible cover because considering it's about one of the most beautiful, famous paintings in the world, that if you see it in a bookshop, that, that girl with a pearl earring, her, that face, you immediately look at it. I mean, it couldn't be more eye-catching. Yeah. They put a, by some perverse thing, they put a jacket on of um, a Vermeer, the only Vermeer sort of um, scene of street life, of, of um, Harlem, I think, or wherever, you know, with lots oh. of church towers and things, in sort of black and white as well. I mean, it didn't, it, oh. anyway, so they rejacketed the book. It, 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 it became a huge hit, a bigger hit than mine, really. Um, <laughs> Well, the mine was pretty big hit. They both were really, but they yeah. both caught some zeitgeist. And of course, hers was immediately made into a very successful film with our friend Colin Firth in it. Um, <laughs> yes. And, yes. and, oh, and yes. mine became, you know, mine was it took twenty years to develop, and everything went wrong. And then um, it was just Why about it so long? because people knew people kept on being hauled in to write it. It was rewritten and rewritten, and it keep, kept kept new writers kept losing the plot because it's got a very, though I say it myself, it's got a fantastic plot. Yeah. With big that twists. Does. And they should have just called you in. You see, this I is know, what I mean I, about wasted resources. I know. I did it, then somebody else did it. Somebody, Christopher Hampton did it. Tom Stoppard did it. Uh, uh, more, uh, lo lots of writers. And um, so it became a bit of a sort of pudding, really, a sort of mess. But it finally was about to be made and John Madden, who directed at uh, the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, very good director. Kira Knightley was a young woman. Jude, Jude Law was the young painter. And Jim Broadbent was the, the boring old husband. 
And I um, have been searching high and low for this, and I can't seem to get it. It, it will reappear. This, on this is different. This is a different film because it was eventually made. But anyway, what happened with that film, to cut a long story short, was it was just about to be, it was a $48 million film, the big British film of the year. All the sets had been done, the costumes, uh, tanks dug to make canals and things. Uh, the Gordon Brown, our chancellor then, lammed a, uh, uh, he, there was some tax arrangement for, for tax friendly arrangements for funding films and he destroyed it overnight because people oh. were fiddling the books. And um, the film was destroyed. And, the, and er, everything, the, the Tracy Chevalier comes back into this story because overnight the film collapsed. Everyone lost their jobs. It was awful. And the, there was a nursery in Thames Ditton outside London that were growing 12,000 tulips for the film. And each tulip was in its own little pot. And it was about this high in bud so that it could flower for, for its moment in the film in two weeks or whatever. And the nursery said, well, you know, what are you gonna do with these? You know, the film's not happening. And I said, well, why don't you deliver, deliver 500 to my front garden? And Tracy lived up the road, she took some. Other people took various, various tulip bulbs, neighbours, and every year I'd see my little film come up in their front gardens, which was very <laughs> And Tracy and I had this bet that whosoever film was made first would buy the other one lunch at the Ivy. So Tracy <laughs> took me off to the Ivy because her film was made, and, and the whole thing collapsed, but then, and Steven Spielberg disappeared, but then our saviour rode out of the sunset, but unfortunately our saviour savior was called Harvey Weinstein. Oh, of course. <laughs> Out of the frying pan, into the fire. He oh. then developed it. And in fact, a film was made with Judy Dench in and Alicia Vikander and Cara Delevingne and Tom Hooper. Lots of people. Really beautiful film, actually. But um, is that why it can't be found now for Love No Money? Not because found. of the Weinstein connection. Yeah, because what happened when the whole sex scandal blew up, some films that he was producing, like Paddington 2, just took his name off them and, and put them in the cinemas. But this film had had a lot of difficulties with editing. He'd, he'd bossed around the editors and had put his own people in and had re got me to rewrite stuff and all sorts of things. And um, so people were feeling quite cherry about the film anyway, the cinemas, um, because they thought it must be a turkey as, as it was constantly being pulled. When he'd announce it and then put it. Anyway, finally, it came out for only a week, one week, with no press and nothing, because that's the way he thought it should be released, just to get it onto DVD. And, and that week, practically, the whole sex scandal blew up and the Weinstein Company was dissolved overnight. So I hired a cinema and had my own premiere. And because um, I'm an extra in the film, I'm always an extra in my You're film. <laughs> I'm a, I'm an old crone drinking a tankard in an Amsterdam um, sitting room. And, um, and so I hired a cinema in London and got some wine in and got 120 friends and put on the movie. And that was our premiere. So instead of all the stars lined up, you know, me and one other extra, a man called Terry Nunn, took to the stage to introduce the film. And he played, I played this old crone and he played a, a brewer in trundling a, barrel along the street or something and they cut his part anyway so i mean he was, <laughs> so we, we we introduced the film and we said let's raise our glasses to all the the small people without whom films can't be made the the oh, people well said. The costume yeah. and the extras and all that stuff and so it was a rather charming alternative premiere um, and you're still talking to tracy <laughs> yes 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 no there's no hard feelings and i'm very glad her film was a success um, and you can get this something on about a, a book that becomes a successful film sort of loses its own identity, isn't it? And I don't, I don't know if that can possibly be a silver lining to such a messy story. But the fact is, Tracy Chevalier's the the film made on her book is is always talked about just that little bit more than the book itself is. I think. Uh, well, uh, I, whereas I, funny enough, in her case, I don't think that's happened because the film was an art house film, quite a small film. And the book has been a bestseller for ages and still you see it in bookshops. So I think she's unusual, but it does happen and the book can fade away. But what you have to remember is that 
the film lies like a hologram over the book and the film will fade away because you can't have films on all the time and the book will always remain. So that's what one comforts oneself with. Good. I know. Nice yeah, and, and, and optimistic. There are worse things in the world. <laughs> in, in the few minutes we have left, I think about 10 minutes, we've, I do want to talk about the most recent book, your, your The Carer, which I, I did, I read recently and Again, yeah. absolutely loved. I don't think there's a single book of yours I haven't loved anyway. So, oh. you know, it's, I'm, I'm starting to sound repetitive. But I did want to ask you about, I mean, we've already touched a little bit upon being old and different perceptions of being old. And I think you just do it so well. I think the, the character, the, the, one of the main characters in it, James, is, I mean, the, the, the portrayal of him is, it's, it's, so, his, it's a complex story and you... You, on the one level you hate him and on the other hand you 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 love him you identify with him and how how do you do this time and again you've got these characters who by and large writers are sort of not if not told by their agents but you're kind of steered away from writing about old people too much and the other thing in it is that is the the sort of class uh divide mm. again you've done that so beautifully so I wonder whether, because I think it's, it's, it's still a relatively new and unknown uh, entity, isn't it? So I don't know whether you want to just say a little bit about the book well, and what, what you brought, what, what, what it meant for you. Yes, it was, um, I wanted to write about a different look at old age because I'd done obviously the best exotic, which was one solution. And this solution was, you know, to have a carer and a, a live-in carer and it was only quite recently, I mean, the book came out two years ago, the paperback came out this year, and it came out in the middle of the pandemic in Britain. And people suddenly were talking about these, these invisible people, these invisible people who, who look after old people and keep them alive and keep them fed and, you know, and um, they're, they're completely unknown and they're underpaid and underappreciated. We now all, you know, have been clapping for carers clapping and every, Thursday that, every Thursday. I, mean, I know the um, Mandy character very well because my, I have a daughter with special needs and, you know, I, I meet Mandy's all the time, people who've, you know, who've... And there is, like, I completely, I could see all of the things, a little bit of scorn that Phoebe and uh, Robert have for this, the care, the person who's caring for their parent. Yeah comes from this kind of class prejudice. And I know that I'm, you know, I, I remember my husband telling me once, our daughter Rohini is turning into a chav. And that, you know, without thinking about it, we sort of, we had a little laugh about the fact that she colors her hair a certain way now, and she wears certain sorts of jewelry, and she wears clothes in a certain way. And she's becoming a bit like her carers was our fear. But I saw this in the book and I thought, this is amazing. How does Debbie know all these things? <laughs> That's very interesting because it's obviously a different, a different age group, but, but, but the influence of the care on the person was yeah. something which I've, I've heard and, and I had with my own mother because she had some live-in carers when she got dementia and, um, and they started sort of dressing her differently. And in, in the book, what happens is the old boy James, the young, this carer, Mandy, middle-aged carer, um, comes along and she starts changing him into somebody slightly different. And his grown up children both sort of resent her, yeah. are terribly guilty that they're not doing it themselves, um, rely on her hugely, um, uh, sort of like her, but, but the class thing, as you were saying, creeps in because their very distinguished old father who's in his eighties and who was a professor of physics and you know, had no BE and stuff, he starts doing scratch cards on the lottery and watching daytime television and going to the Bista retail village, which, you know, in England, <laughs> which is not the sort of place that somewhere like that would go to. And, um, and she takes him down market and he loves it. He has a hoot. He's and the time of his life. Yeah. He's had the time of his life. And the two children um, slightly resent this, but also they, they can't do anything because they're, they're not going to give up their lives to look after him. One of them's, trying to write an absolutely impossibly difficult novel. Sounds, you know, a, 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 a quite a boring novel set in old Radnisher dialect, Welsh dialect. The other one's having a terrible on-off affair with a man who lives in a hut in Wales. They're, both their lives are pretty chaotic and um, they haven't got time or inclination or skills to look after their father. And they also, and this is what happens 
in the book, um, it, they start to get a bit suspicious of her because they find that she's been sort of fiddling around with their father's papers and mm -hmm. maybe looking at his will and, you know, what's, is she going to kill him off and get, get him to write the will in favour of her or something? So there's, and, and then halfway through the book, there's a humongous plot twist which mm -hmm. throws everything in a completely different direction. But again, the, the, the unease that the son and daughter have towards how close their father is growing to the carer is another thing which I think the Indian in me was sort of uh, recognizing straight away because again, many of us who live in India and who have elderly parents in India sort of resort to having, you know, domestic help staff yeah. engaging with, you know, looking after our parents. And uh, they're, they're, it's not such an unusual thing to begin to worry about how much control they're beginning to exert over the, the aging, you know, the elderly. Well, that's the thing. And, and whatever age group you are, funny enough, I had lunch yesterday with a, a man of my age who was brought up in India. And he, like many, many British people, he, he was looked after by an ayah who was, he was much closer to than his mother, who was rather standoffish and stiff and British and always at cocktail parties and things. And, and then he was sent to her, you know, school in England. And the same thing happens with the elderly. You know, if you're having domestic help, you've got a helpless child or a helpless old person, and that domestic help is going to have central emotional importance in their life. And you better get used to it, you know, yeah. because that, that's gonna happen. The dramatic uh, plot twist. I kept thinking there's a Hindi movie in this. <laughs> it, it's it's made for Bollywood. So if there is someone listening in, just read a book called The Carer. It's got a brilliantly yeah. sort of um, something which I think a lot of Indians would identify with straight away. So, yeah. so thank you very much for the hours and hours of entertainment. Honestly, Debbie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It's so nice to talk to you again. <laughs> well, I, I was remembering the last time we met was when I, I sort of followed you and got you to talk to my colleagues at the BBFC. I don't know whether you remember this. You yeah, talked about yeah. script writing. Yeah. And uh, then my boss, who, I mean, for people like me who've never had an expense account, you know, it was quite a delight that my boss said, oh, do take her out for a meal afterwards. And we went <laughs> and had a great big uh, meal at a Kerala restaurant. I remember that. And then when you mounted your cycle and sort of disappeared into the dusk, <laughs> I thought that was the last I'd seen of you, actually. So maybe I can, yes, wave you as you get onto your metaphoric bike and, you know, <laughs> into the Bangalore dusk. <laughs> you still pedal away. Lovely, that would be. <laughs> but it is so lovely, albeit virtually. It's, it's been lovely to have you here in my living room. It's, it's uh, so. very nice. I know I'm looking at it. So yes, I have nice <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it, it sounds like you're back in London anyway now, so you, you know, no, no reason why you shouldn't just come over. Exactly. There's no more lockdown, yeah. <laughs> Not for us anyway. Well, thank you. He's back. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. No, just such a delightful conversation. And I think um, most of us in Bangalore will uh, be thrilled about the fact that we've started with Bangalore, ended with Bangalore, and had just so much of the city uh, from uh, from two people that uh, that seem to love the city and and know it perhaps in ways that a lot of us today don't. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. He's older than you are, Sri. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that was such fun. Thank you all so much. That was great. Thank you, Josh. I'll see, I'll see you in London. See you. We'll see you soon. Thank Excellent. you. Thank, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you, Jayshree. Bye. Uh, bye. Thank, thank you. you all. We'll be back again soon. Thank you. Bye.